Canada. Uh, uh, she's originally from Canada, uh, Toronto. Uh, she studied in uh, Calgary. She got a PhD in uh, insect entomology. So it's not insects. Yeah, I think it's something like that. Uh, <laughs> And uh, then she moved to Australia and got uh, the predecessor of Bigra, which is uh, a science postdoctoral um, uh, fellowship. Uh, she also has a Brunswick Dice uh, fellowship to work on this kind of problem that she's going to talk about with the relationship between uh, uh, insect behavior uh, and how we can solve insect culture problems. So uh, she's here, so she will not welcome in her. Yeah, so thanks, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, as, uh, as Sylvie said, I'm a, I'm a biologist, so I feel like I need to preface everything with, uh, you know, this is going to be primarily about some of the biology, um, but I hope that by the end of this, I'll have gotten you guys interested, and maybe we can start thinking about, I'm hoping, forging some, some useful collaborations, because I think there's a lot of scope for a biologist to work, you know, with computer scientists, with engineers, and with people in um, non-biological disciplines. Um, but we'll see if we can, I can get you to, uh, to agree with that. So first of all, I mean, this is sort of a very general thing that I probably don't need to say to you guys, but um, infrastructure is really important. Obviously, you know, everything from our power grids to our transportation networks um, to our supply chains. Uh, and as societies become more complex, so have our infrastructure are now you know, highly interconnected and, and highly um, complex. So we have this, this situation we've got, we need to develop methods of trying to manage these. Now, this might be a bit more surprising, but you can also make the same argument for biological systems. So many biological systems have what we could call infrastructures, systems that are very key to the functioning of the organism or the colony. Um, these include things like transportation networks. So uh, you can have trail systems can, that are constructed by social insects like ants or termites. Um, you can have the vascular vein and capillary networks that kind of go throughout our bodies. You can have the tubial networks of things like slime mold, or the mycelia, so those little sort of string things that make up a fungus, together form networks. And just like um, human in human transportation networks, these structures are responsible for moving um, various things from place to place. You can have communication systems or communication networks. Uh, the most basic for most insects uh, is very, very simple. So it's one insect passing food to another insect, and in that food is, in, uh, is, is information about where it came from. And you see that with ants, and you see that with bees. It's very simple, just passes very basic information on. Uh, this just to give you an example, though, although it's a very simple system, uh, on aggregate it can get quite complex. These are two examples of trophallaxis networks from two different organisms. Uh, the blue over here is a honeybee network, or sorry, an ant network, and this is one from honeybees. And basically each of those nodes is an ant, and then it's the connections show who that particular ant has been passing food to. So essentially, it graphs out the flow of, um, of liquid and thus information throughout a colony. So they can be quite complicated, even though we're just talking about passing food back and forth. But probably one of the best examples of a communication system in any insect is what honeybees do. And I don't know how many, are any of you familiar with the honeybee waggle dance? A few of you? Okay, cool. Those of you who aren't, this is, this is great. <laughs> so Honeybees do, and a bee comes back to a colony after finding a good food source. Is so fascinating as they make these. And she does a little waggle. To so she comes in and she, you know, she's vibrating her, egg, her abdomen. Now, the angle of that, of that movement indicates the direction of the food source relative to the, um, the azimuth of the sun. So it's a symbolic representation of which direction the bees need to find, go to find that resource. The length of that waggle tells them how far away the food source is, um, and how excited she is tells them how good it is. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the only example of symbolic language outside of humans, and it's, it's fairly complex if you think about what a bee has to do to actually decode the food you need. So, uh, on any beehive at any given degrees, time, you can right. have you know, 50 or 60 of these bees each straggling right in the direction side. of their food sources. You have other bees following those dances, getting that information, and then flying out to who it is. Um, and this is so precise that we can watch a bee colony, measure these things, measure the angles, and then run it through um, and just compute where that food source is, and we can walk out and find where the bees are um, just by decoding their language. So. Although you can have really simple methods of communication, you can also have fairly sophisticated methods of communication uh, depending on the organism. Uh, I wonder, how did you figure this one out? Yeah, well, the, 
<laughs> the guy you figured out got a Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> it's those bone fish. Um, and it's hard. I mean, what he, he basically ended up marking a lot of bees, then watching where they went, you know, and then putting up artificial feeders and trying to figure it out. And even once he'd done a good job, there was a lot of debate about whether they were actually communicating or whether other bees were just picking up the scent of the food from that bee and using that information. So he had to do things like putting things that had identical smell but were in different locations to kind of work out that no, it had to be actual um, distance. But yeah, it's a really complicated kind of thing to work out. And it's just this amazing example of what you can do, even if you've got a teeny tiny little you know, pinhead brain, there's still some pretty amazing things these creatures are capable of. Now this in the corner um, is probably the weirdest organism I work with. Um, so mostly I study insects, but I also sometimes study slime molds, which are basically just gigantic amoebas. I'll, I'll tell you all about them in a minute. Um, but the point I want to just make at this level, so here we go, uh, this is a slime mold just oozing, uh, sort of pulsing and, and oscillating. Um, and what we know about slime molds, and you can see it really well here when it goes in front of the light, um, is that this is sort of how, or part of how the slime mold communicates within the organism. So when the slime is in contact with something it likes, like a food source, it'll start vibrating or oscillating faster. If it's in contact with something it doesn't like, oh, so those are the veins of the slime mold there, just to give you a sense of what it looks like. Um, if it's in contact with something it doesn't like, it'll go much slower. So that's cool, but what's cooler is that each of these little oscillating regions can entrain the oscillating regions next to it. So you can have information kind of flowing through the organism based on these oscillating regions, although the details of how that works we're not entirely clear on, but that seems to be the, the general pattern. So we've got all these different kinds of communication systems amongst biological systems that range from sort of the really simple, you know, basically just throwing up and getting somebody else to eat that throw up to get information, um, all the way to these really complicated bee dances and things, just heaps of different ways. Um, and obviously the type of communication system you have probably influences how the system as a whole will function. Um, we can also talk about supply chains. I won't spend quite as much time on this, but I mean, when you think about it, an insect colony is out there sourcing food. It has to process food, has to find a way to bring it back, has to store that food, has to distribute it amongst its colony mates. Um, and a lot of this can be sort of thought of as, as a supply chain. And I put up this example because the cat here seems, is that going to turn out the front light so it's a little bit clearer to see some of the pictures? It might be a little easier. So if you look here, I know it's a bit blurry, but it might be a little clearer. Uh, this is an ant. This is the head of the ant here. Ah, yeah, there we go. And this is its massive swollen abdomen. <laughs> so that ant is full of sugar water. Uh, these are called honey pot ants. And the way they store their food um, is that other ants will come back with liquid food, so sugar water, give it to these guys, and their entire function is to be a living storage system. So they are functioning as living pots, if you will. They hang from the bottom of the colony with these big swollen abdomens. When other individuals need food, they come to them and they regurgitate it for them. So. <laughs> This is like a living, a living warehouse. So what I think is interesting about these systems is, you know, they have no leader. So often when we think of ants, we think of the queen ant or the queen bee. And, and because of the words we use to describe her, there's this perception that she must be smarter or more in charge or, or something. She's not. I mean, the queen insect, the, the best way to think of her is she is the reproductive parts of the colony. Her job is to reproduce, and that is all. She has no role in terms of directing what the others are doing. In most cases, she's actually quite a bit dumber than all the other individuals. I mean, she just reproduces, that's it. So if you think of a colony as being a superorganism, she is the superorganism gonad. You know, that, that is the extent of her participation. Um, the other interesting thing about these, these systems is that they usually don't have any blueprint. So they're not building towards a plan that each individual ant knows and works towards. They are making decisions typically based just on local information and very, very simple individual behaviors. Despite that, you get these beautiful complex structures and complex patterns and um, complex <coughs> behaviors, all of which are resulting from very, very simple underlying behaviors in general. So the spiral thing there is the um, brood comb of a stingless bee, which is one of the species of bee we have here in Australia. And that giant thing is a termite mound. Um, and again, each individual termite who built that mound wasn't thinking, ah, I need to put a block here so that we get this nice structure. I mean, he's not doing that. <laughs> he's more or less just thinking, here's a block, drop next to block, um, and rules along those lines. And so one of the, the questions that I kind of, when I started my postdoc, what I was interested in understanding is how do you start with relatively simple basic creatures with no leader and no blueprint? How do you go from that level 
pretty complex structures or complex system level behaviors. So there's more movement. So what I'm going to do for this talk, I'm going to stick with mostly with biology because that's what I know, that's what I understand. So we'll talk about animal infrastructures. Well, animal kind of in, in common because slimals aren't animals, but we'll just ignore that for now. Um, we'll talk about transportation networks and supply chains in a little bit more detail. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the project I'm working on now, which is looking at resilience in these systems. And then I'll ask the question at the end of, can we learn anything from these systems? And you know, depending on your background, you might be like, yes, we can learn heaps, or it might be like, no. <laughs> you know, this is a ridiculous way about going about things. So I'll talk a little bit about why I think it might be a useful way to, to solve problems. Um, we'll start with transportation networks now. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to think of a human society that's been able to exist without having a reasonably well-developed transportation network. Um, and we use these for moving, <laughs> for moving people, products, and information from place to place. It's a key component of our, of our society. Um, and, I, and this is probably a review for most of you, but for me, this is like a whole new concept. <laughs> but um, when you're designing a, a transportation network, um, it can be difficult to come up with a good transportation network because there's often more than one criteria that you need to optimize. So taking a really simple version of this, let's say we need to connect these points up. Let's pretend they're cities in a country or houses in something, parts of a network. I mean, you can try to connect them in a way that minimizes the total cost of the network. And there's, there's structures that'll do that, so a minimal spanning tree in this case. It's low cost. Um, but any kind of damage on that network and something is going to be isolated. So it, it lacks robustness. It's easy to kind of isolate part of that network. Um, you know, and, and anywhere you do that in this network, you're basically, any kind of disruption is going to cause at least one of these cities or nests or, or whatever to be isolated. Uh, it's also not particularly efficient. So if I want to go from point A to point B here, I mean, they're close as the crow flies. But if I use this particular network, it's going to take me forever and take me through this circuitous route that I don't really want to use. So it's not the most efficient in terms of an individual moving through that network. I mean, you can throw this the other way and say, okay, I, what I'm gonna do is build a really robust network. This is one way to do that. It's very robust. You can see that I can break a lot of different net, or a lot of different links before eventually severing at least one of those nodes from the network. Um, it's okay as far as efficiency. It's not as, it, there, there's more efficient ways to do this. So if you say you connected every point to every other point, for me as an individual, that would be better, but this is pretty good. Uh, but of course, it's expensive. If I were building this, this is going to, and if each um, meter of track costs me some money, this is going to cost me a mint, and there's going to be lots of that network that are underutilized. So it's, it's not necessarily the best way to go in terms of cost. Now, what does any of this have to do with ants? <laughs> You're probably wondering at this point. Um, well, ants also build transportation networks, um, and they vary in how they do so. So some species, like the ones out there uh, that you can see up here, um, are following pheromone trail networks, so this invisible network of chemicals that the ants deposit as they walk. Um, other ants are more attracted to that pheromone, and from that you have this emerging, this complex network um, that connects the colony to other nests and potentially to other food sources. Um, this is probably a very low-cost network because it doesn't actually cost the ants very much to produce this pheromone. On the other hand, you also have species that invest a lot more in their networks. So this here, uh, if you can see, is basically a, a walled network. So here is, these are where the ants are at. Adopter of ants. And those are little structures they've built along the side of the trench. They've dug a trench, they've built walls around the trench, and they're using that as part of their network. And then down in the corner here, this is a meat ant network, so an ant species that's common in Australia. Uh, and what they do is they actually cut the grass um, between their different nests of food sources, so that it's easier for them to walk. So you can see they've cut this little path. And both of those behaviors are a lot more expensive. They involve a lot more investment into the network than, say, just putting down a pheromone trail. And so one of the first things, in a very general sense, I wanted to look at was to understand to what extent the cost of building that network influences the sort of topology we see. Is there a difference between the nest networks built by these sort of cheap pheromone species versus those that are investing a lot? So the first species I worked with is this little guy. It's the, uh, not the big ant, it's the little ant attacking the giant ant. Uh, they're Argentine ants. Um, they are, I mean, I, I love them, but they are pretty terrible. <laughs> they are one of the world's top 100 most invasive species. So, you know, as the name suggests, they're not native to Australia. They were brought in here accidentally years ago. They've basically taken over. So if you see little brown ants anywhere in a city, it's probably an Argentine ant. And they're, they're massively common. And they do tend to kill all the native ants when they're in the area. So from an ecological perspective, not great. 
Um, from my perspective, they're awesome because they're super easy to keep in the lab. So <laughs> they're great for doing experiments, not for necessarily ecology. Um, and what I like about them is that they have multiple nests. So you might think of your typical ant colony, you have one nest, one colony, and from that colony you have branches going out to food sources or whatever. The difference with things like Argentine ants is they're what we call polydomous. They have multiple nests, um, all of which are part of the same colony, and they're all connected with trail networks. So all of the ants in this network would be um, relatives to one another. They're all interacting. Um, there's usually multiple queens in these systems as well. These things can get ridiculous. So currently there, the largest network we know of is the European super colony, which stretches over 6,000 <laughs> kilometers. <laughs> 6,000 kilometers of interacting ants. <laughs> there is some evidence we have the similar super colony in Australia that goes from Melbourne all the way up to Sydney. Um, that seems to also be one sort of network of interacting ants. So these things, they form very big networks. Uh, the problem is, of course, mapping these things is difficult, and we still don't know the extent to which all of these different nests are interacting. So whether it's like one continuous network or whether they're sort of which sub-networks in there um, is not clear. But certainly all these individuals will cooperate. You can move them from place to place. They won't fight. They're, they're all mates, and there's a fair amount of connection between them. Now, the trails that they build between nests are important because the ants use them to move food around. So you know, if one nest has found a lot of food, it can use those to transport food out to the others. Um, they're important for redistributing larvae, which is what's happening here. This is an ant carrying a little a pupa, so a cocoon. Um, and they'll move larvae around to places that are better for them. So if this nest is getting too hot, they'll pick up their larvae and, and move them somewhere else. Uh, and they can also use it to redeploy workers. So if a food source is discovered on the far end of the network, ants from the other nest can get up, use the network to go to that food source so that they can monopolize it and outcompete all the other ants that are hanging around. So this, these internest networks are a really important component of this species' competitive strategy, and they're probably one of the reasons that they're doing so well. Um, so there's some reason to expect that ants may be optimizing their networks in some way or the other, or at least that there's selective pressure for them to do something clever. Um, the reason is that travel on trails, for one thing, is, is dangerous. So whenever an ant is leaving its nest, going to another nest, there's a chance that something will eat it, or that somebody will step on it, or that it will desiccate in the sun. Um, and that kind of means if you have some insanely sort of circuitous route, then that increases the probability you're going to lose members of your colony. It's probably not a good thing. Uh, there's also a cost in terms of time and, and more importantly, energy. So as you're walking, you're burning calories. Again, a circuitous route means lots of individuals are burning calories. You need to get more food. Um, and then depending on how much the species has invested in that trail network, there's probably a cost of maintaining it. Um, particularly so if you have one of those networks where you have to actually clear all the grass. Um, once you build that network, you have to invest into keeping it, um, keeping it clear. So there's reason to think there might be efficiency, or, or at least some selection towards efficient trail networks. Um, so we tested this in a very basic way in the lab, uh, using an exceedingly high-tech system. So that is a pond from Bunnings that we spray-painted white <laughs> uh, and drilled holes into. Uh, and you can just see where those red circles are. There are little sticks. So there's a hole where the circle is, and there's a stick going underneath the arena. And that leads to an ant nest. So the ants can climb up the stick into that white arena, uh, and they can connect those points however they want. So to make it simple for me to analyze, because I said I'm a biologist, <laughs> you know, I wanted something simple, we started with triangles and squares. So nest arranged in a triangle, nest arranged in a square, and then we just let the ants do whatever they wanted. Yeah. Um, so I kind of half expected to see there to be random points or something. Um, but the ants are, are cleverer than that, it turns out. And so these are just some examples of what we get. Um, what you're actually looking at are overlays. So we take a photograph every 10 seconds and then just smush 10 of them across on top of each other. And that allows us to see much more clearly where the actual trail network is. Those red points, again, are the nests. So that, those are the points that they need to connect. And that trail is what the ants actually did. So if you look, you notice that most of these are actually fairly minimal. There's minimal tannin trees. And shiner minimal trees in there, which are the um, shortest, well, amongst the shortest ways to possibly do that. Um, and so remember, these ants individually are really, really stupid. <laughs> like, I, I love these ants, but they're probably the dumbest creature I've ever worked with. Um, if you put them in a tea maze where you feed them on the left side you know, 10 times, they will not remember that. <laughs> you know, they, they'll go 50 50 each time. They can't, they're not good at problem solving, they're not good at uh, routing as individuals. But groups of them do this fairly regularly. So you put a lot of them together, 
and you get these really minimal <coughs> topologies, um, which I think is really, really impressive given the simplicity of individual ants. And, and for fun, sometimes in my, uh, my undergraduate classes, we put up those pictures and say, can you guys connect these three points using the shortest amount of path and see what percentage of students can actually, can actually do it versus the percentage of ants that can actually do it. So it's not necessarily the simplest <laughs> problem. Um, and so things that uh, I wondered when I saw these things, because as you can see, they're minimal in terms of cost. Yeah? Well, sort of. So in the triangle, we get mostly Steiner trees. In the square, which I didn't, I don't have a slide up here, we get mostly minimal spanning trees. So for some, I think when you start getting more complicated, we stop getting away from the Steiner trees, probably because they're a little bit, I assume they're harder for the calling to come up with. But And then, okay, I wasn't going to talk about this part, but if you keep adding ants, you can put in heaps and heaps of ants, then you start to get weird things happening. Like you'll get a Steiner tree with then a random just trail going out to nowhere. So it seems like there's this sort of golden amount of ants in which you get these nice topologies, but if you exceed that, then you get that topology plus something extra. And that something extra, I, I was really hoping that that extra thing would say add robustness or do something. It doesn't. It's just like a random trail that doesn't seem to be adding any actual functionality to the network itself. Um, yeah. But a surprising number, and I mean, of course, you get the odd one that's just ridiculous looking. But by and large, the majority of these problems are either spanning trees or Steiner trees. So, oh, sorry. so when I look at this, the thing that struck me was that these are not particularly robust, right? These are the, the worst in terms of any, any damage that trail is going to cause one of the nests to be um, isolated. And so kind of an weighty story that I told myself is that, well, okay, that actually makes sense because Argentine ants are laying trail pheromone all the time. Um, if you put a barrier around them, say here, then the ants eventually just follow the wall laying pheromone, and then you know, they find the other end of the wall and they rejoin the trail. So these networks are inherently self-healing. It's very hard to damage them without, in a way that they can't fix very quickly. So maybe there's no point in having a robust network. And why build a network that's robust if you can heal damage straight away? And I really like that story. Um, but there are some cautionary tales out there about cleverness because you can get Steiner trees from soap bubbles. So if you set this up properly, just because of properties I don't personally understand, but something to do with energy and humidity and something like that, you can get these Steiner trees just as an emergent sort of physical process. So I can't necessarily say for sure that what the ants are doing um, is necessarily the result of selection to create these minimal networks because they're self-healing, because it might just be the way these systems tend to, to, to work. So I'm still kind of not sure about that one. So what I decided to do then is look at another species of ant. So let's leave these really simple systems where they're just laying pheromone, and let's look at something that's actually investing a little bit more in its network. So the idea being that in this case, maybe we'll start to see things that are a bit more robust because they're investing a lot in these networks. They're not easy to just rebuild. Um, this is the Australian meat ant, which is this species of ant found all over Australia. Have any of you guys seen meat ants or stepped on meat ants? Oh, oh they're, they're really Yeah, they're very bitey and very aggressive. Uh, <laughs> so if you get near their nest, they all just swarm at you. Um, and they make these big mounds. They're very, very, I've seen them. Yeah, they're very, very obvious ones if you know what to look for. Um, they're dominant throughout Australia. And the most important feature is that they do actually make these cleared trails. Um, as a bit of an aside, they don't always clear trails to their food sources. So one of the experiments we're looking at now is trying to understand under what conditions they actually decide to invest in that versus um, just you know, walking along the grass and accepting that cost. So what we looked at is 110 different meat ant networks, um, mapped them out. So I was kind of lucky, in fact, that a colleague of mine had actually done this work um, seven years ago and just sort of had it sitting around, she had all these networks that she'd mapped that she hadn't analyzed. So we took those. What you're looking at, the circles with the T at them, oh, so they start with the, the black points are where the nests are actually located. The black lines between those are the trails, the actual cleared trails. And the circles with a T are trees. Now these trees are extremely important for the colonies because that is their main source of food. The ants, however, are not feeding on the tree. They're feeding on the secretions of insects that are feeding on the tree. So what they do is they farm colonies of aphids or scale insects, um, which produce this sugary secretion. The ants will protect them from predators in exchange for this food source. So they've actually domesticated these insects. They're keeping them the way we would keep a herd of cattle for, for milk, or in this case, for sugar water. 
Um, they will defend these trees against other colonies because there's a lot of competition for these species. Um, and they are the main source of carbohydrates for the colony, so they're really important. Um, the black X's territorial boundaries are, uh, because meat ants are also very territorial, um, and you can tell where the borders are because they, although they can be very aggressive, uh, competition between them directly is very destructive. So what these ants have actually evolved is this sort of symbolic thing where if one ant from another colony sees another ant from the colony, they just will dance. And the other one does the dance back. They do it a couple times, and whichever one's bigger eventually wins, and the smaller one just backs off. So they don't, they very rarely actually fight, but you can actually work out where the barriers are by looking for these little sort of territory dances. It's really weird. <laughs> uh, I should also point out that most uh, of the analysis of these networks was done by my colleague, Ganel Cabanis, who's a computer scientist in, in Paris. So he was responsible for a lot of the, the more graph theory analysis type things. So we, we looked at three things, these networks. We worked out how robust they are, and we worked out, we called, or we defined robustness uh, as the proportion of trails that you needed to remove from the network before you isolated at least one nest. We also uh, looked at efficiency, which was the mean shortest distance between any nodes, or between two nodes of the network averaged over all the nodes. And then we looked at cost, which is just the total sum of all the different trails in the network. Um, and you can kind of, we've normalized these tables and it's terrible, but if you were to look at robustness, efficiency, and cheapness, because again, this is all about trade-offs, and you were to put that Delaunay triangulation, which remember is that really robust, efficient, and expensive thing, um, that's kind of where it would fall, that's what it would look like. If you plotted the minimal spanning tree, um, this is what you would see, so remember it's super, super cheap, but it's not particularly robust, it's not particularly, it's sort of moderately efficient. Um, the Argentine ants, the colonies I showed you before, would follow that red triangle because they're primarily standard trees and, and spanning tree type things. Uh, and that's kind of where the meat ants fall. So they, unlike the, um, the Argentine ants, which seem to be just making these very minimal networks that have zero robustness, the uh, meat ants seem to be doing something that's more in between. It's almost like a trade-off between those three things. So they're they're moderately robust, they're moderately efficient, and they mo have moderate cost. They kind of fall right in the middle, um, which is more or less what we actually would have predicted. Again, because they're investing so much in that infrastructure, we sort of imagined that they would be um, more robust than an, ant ne or than, than an Argentine ant network, but of course there's still a cost there, so we don't expect them to just have the maximally robust network. And you can see that if you look at the top. So those are the, the line triangulation and the minimal spanning tree, those two shapes that do uh, maximize uh, robustness or cost, or minimize cost rather, and there's the meat ant network. It kind of looks like an in-between of both of those things, so it's sort of the moderate solution here, which I thought was fairly fairly cool, because again, these are not the cleverest organisms. If they've come up um, at least from this kind of way of analysis, a analyzing them fairly efficient. Um, the other thing we looked at just briefly, uh, remember there's trees and there's nests, and we were curious about how um, the meat ants sort of built their network. So whether they treated a nest the same as a tree in terms of the position in the network. Um, and it turns out they don't. So in this case, the red bars are random networks. We, we generated random networks where we kept the position of the points the same um, and the number of connections the same, but sort of randomized which nodes were connected up. And then we compared that to the blue, which are the real networks. So you can see here, so oops, this is for the number of links, the number of connections to any one node. On average, the nests, um, <coughs> excuse me, on average, the nests have fewer links um, than random, uh, as do the trees. So they're not quite as um, linked up as you might expect them to be if they were just random, which is kind of not particularly surprising. Uh, and if we look in terms of how central they are in the network, um, then you can see that nests are, are very central, and so the centrality was our way of looking at Pretty much, it, what it shows us is how important that node is in terms of things flowing through the network. So something with high centrality is going to probably come into contact with more stuff than, say, something with low centrality. Um, and you can see the nests are more central than random, but the trees are less central than random. And again, that and it's kind of obvious, actually, when you look at the picture. I mean, the trees are very much on the outside of the network. They usually only have one link towards other nests, whereas the nests occupy a much more central role. And again, that makes sense given the nests are where the food is going to, they're being used to distribute the food, they're warehouses, they have this really important role in terms of the flows through the system. The trees are just producing. That's all they do. There's no um, flow back in the other direction. So, I mean, again, after we looked at it, like, oh yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, sort of what you would expect. 
Okay, so I'm going to end with ants for a little bit. What we found is that the ants are building these low-cost networks on the Steiner trees and the minimal trees, um, but that the mean ants are doing something completely different. They seem to be balancing cost efficiency and robustness. And there was recently a study that looked at a, um, that went back through the literature and looked at other networks from other ants that had been collected for other reasons, uh, and generally found that most of the ones they collected in the field were also doing this balance between cost efficiency and robustness. Um, the caveat there being that those field studies are almost always ant species that are clearing trails. So we don't have very much data for those that are just using pheromones to actually to really compare and work out how extensive <coughs> this or how often this pattern actually holds. Um, but at this point, it seems like that's the way it is. Pheromone species are doing minimal things. Um, ones that are investing in infrastructure are doing um, more balancing. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears and kingdoms of life here a little bit. Um, because now I want to tell you a little, a little bit about transportation networks in this thing, which is the acellular slime mold Fusarium polycephalum. Um, I have worked with some fairly unusual systems in my life, but this thing is by far the weirdest organism I've even ever heard of. So first of all, all that yellow goo you see is, so that's one cell, and these things can go to be five meters across, so that's enormous. Uh, this video is sped up, so you don't need to be too scared. <laughs> But even having said that, these things move at about five centimeters per hour. So it's almost, you can almost see them. Like you turn around, it's moved slightly. Um, and what they do is they kind of flow across the forest floor, um, engulfing and consuming anything they can get their little pseudopods on. So you see, they, they really like mushrooms, it turns out. So there's one digesting a mushroom. Lovely. Um, <laughs> and these are kind of the epitome of a decentralized system. Um, because you can cut that slime mold into as many pieces as you want. Each of those pieces basically instantly becomes a fully functional individual capable of independent behavior. Um, if you then put those things back together again, you know, the next day, they happily merge and become one individual again. So killing these things is, is really hard. Um, <laughs> and this is the same video I showed before, but at least let's begin to really bring home that point. The whole organism is oscillating. It's all pulsing. And that seems to form the basis of its communication system. But you can see it, it's so amorphous that you start off with this blob, and here you can see now the veins are starting to form, uh, and that transportation network is kind of rebuilding itself. If you were to, say, take some of the goo that's flowing through that vein, separate it, and leave it, it would just start reorganizing itself into a system of veins again, straight away. So <coughs> yeah, it's a really, really bizarre, flexible, um, decentralized creature. But yeah, one cell. So if you've ever seen the movie The Blob, <laughs> that's basically what this thing is. It's indescribable, indestructible, and nothing can stop it. So that's slowly, you can see it's just slowly burning and eating the... Yeah, so it can, it's biomass, as I said. But it, the biomass inside the vein is the same as the biomass outside of the vein. It just becomes more rigid. It's able to change the structure of it. So it just forms sort of a rigid sheath around stuff on the inside. But they can switch places. Uh, and, and when it engulfs food, what it does is it forms a food vacuole. So if this is food, it'll kind of go and close that into like a little um, slime wrap ball, I guess. And that will kind of travel in pieces through those veins and distribute it across the organism. So now bear in mind that this is one, this is <coughs> basically moving snot. I mean, there, there's no brain here, there's no organs, there's not really a lot of internal structure. Um, but despite that, we are finding that slime molds can do a huge range of incredibly clever things. So one of the first experiments I did with them, I was looking at trade-offs between risk and food quality. So slime molds hate light. That's one of the things they actually don't particularly like. They kind of go away from light. But they love oatmeal. <laughs> I don't know why. They love oatmeal. So you can make food sources that vary in the amount of powdered oatmeal you put in them. So some are very concentrated. Yes, awesome food source. Some are very dilute. Eh, less good. If you give a slime mold a choice between a concentrated one and a not concentrated one, no surprises there. It'll actually move to the more concentrated ones. Um, and just to show you what that looks like, in case you're wondering, these are three of these oatmeal food discs. The one on the top is more concentrated than the other two. And that yellow sort of bleh is a piece of slime mold that I've just scraped off of the main one and just <laughs> plopped down. <laughs> and you can see it's about an hour later. It's sort of sorted itself out. Now it's got um, those blobby yellow things. We call them pseudopods spreading. What's important, though, I want you to really notice is that there's yellow on all three of the food discs we put there. So it's not like it's only going towards the good one. It's sort of sampling all of them. Um, the other thing I need to point out is that this isn't gross. 
So in this time scale, we're not talking about the organism growing, we're talking about it redistributing, it's moving, it's pushing its biomass back and forth. Uh, this is about four hours in, and you can see what it's done now. It's starting to prefer the one on the top, but more importantly, you see how the veins on the other two fluid sources are kind of turning white? And that's because it's retracting biomass, and that causes the top of the veins to sort of collapse. It, it leaves those veins behind, kind of like a, kind of like a snail leaves a trail of slime. And so you can see them getting whiter as it pulls back. Oops, until the very end, you have all of the goo on the better food source and no goo on the smaller food, on the less food source. So this is sort of a very simple problem, but what we did um, to make this more complicated for the slime mold is we'd have a really concentrated food source in the light versus a less concentrated one in the dark. So this one is safe, but not the best quality. This one's a bit more dangerous, but you know, it's better quality food. And then we let the slime mold decide between lots of different pairs of these. So some, that were, some in which the good one was way better, some in which it was only a little bit better. And what we found is that the slime mold would choose the one in the light only if it was at least five times better than the one in the dark. So there's actually this threshold at which the slime mold will switch its behavior and start eating the one in the light. If it's not at least five times better, it's like, oh, whatever, <laughs> and goes to the dark. So somehow this creature is be able to make these trade-offs between light uh, risk and food quality in its decision making, it has no brain. <laughs> this thing doesn't even have neurons, yet somehow it's able to do these kinds of decisions. Um, and I still don't really actually know how it's doing it. It's very, very weird. Um, the other thing it can do, um, it doesn't seem to have memory in the same way that we do, or at least we've never been able to show that in all the experiments we've tried. And I keep trying because that would be awesome, but no luck so far. But it, what it does have is an externalized memory. So if you go back, you see, <coughs> That part in the middle where it's just this white blob, that's the slime trail. That's no longer active. It's just goo that's been um, left behind. Um, technically, the term for that is extracellular slime, but I just call it goo because that's pretty much what it is. Um, but what we found is that, that the slime will, um, it doesn't necessarily over that goo. So it'll touch it, but it'll kind of retract. But this isn't an all or one thing. If you put a food cue, it'll still go over that goo to get to the food. So it's not. Um, like it never goes over its own stuff. And so we hypothesized that that would allow it to have much more efficient search because it doesn't search the same areas twice unless it searched the whole thing. Uh, and we were able to show that. And then just to kind of show you again, uh, we set up this thing called a U-shaped trap. So what you're looking at, you see that sort of lighter area that's sort of in a, like a box of one size, I think. Um, what that is is a piece of plastic that's on top of the agar plate. Slime molds won't go over the plastic. They hate it. It's too dry. Um, and then at the bottom, <coughs> see if I put the cursor right there, is a food source. So what the slime mold, and the slime mold is up here. So the slime mold can detect that food source because it's diffusing throughout the agar. And what most things will do who are just using chemotaxis, so that's how cells move up a gradient. So imagine you're the slime mold. All you're doing, oops, where's my cursor here? Oh, here we go. All you're doing is moving up the gradient, so that's fine. It's getting stronger, stronger. Boom, you hit this wall. You're kind of stuck because you're, you're, as far as you're concerned, the next step is always more, so you can't really get out of this trap. Now, what, what this, if, it's, if, an, if a creature is being caught, what it will do is come down, okay, can't, and then it'll turn around and come up like this. But that would require it to, to at least temporarily go against the gradient, so it's going against what it knows is the best source, and that's um, a much more complex behavior. And so here's the slime mold actually doing it. Yeah, it's kind of spreading out, so slime mold is sped up again, so don't, don't freak out. <laughs> you know, it hits the wall, oh darn. Oh well, I guess I'll go this way. And out it comes and it finds the food. So it's able to navigate out of this trap, and we think the reason it can do this is because of that extracellular slime. So it knows it's already searched this area. It's a little bit repelled, knows, <laughs> it's repelled by its own goo, um, and then gradually, because of that repellence, it'll find its way around. And just to test that it was the goo causing this, we ran the experiment again, except we let the, we put the slime mold in a dish where a slime mold, um, where it, but a different fragment of it, so that's confusing, had already covered it. So in this case, we've essentially taken away its memory because the whole dish looks like it's already been searched from the slime mold's perspective. Um, and you can see it doesn't doesn't particularly like this. <laughs> it's, it's first of all, it's a lot more um, disorganized in its foraging in general. But here it goes. It eventually finds the food, hits the wall, bounces around. I'm doing, oh, what a beauty, this is terrible. <laughs> and eventually it kind of comes up, goes around. I mean, it basically it has, eventually it will find it, but it's much, 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 much harder for it. 
So what we think that shows is that that extracellular slime is a real key component in organizing <coughs> the foraging and how this animal, animal, how this cell searches the environment. Um, so that, that, was a, that was fun. <laughs> A few other things it can do, I'll go over these ones really quickly. Uh, it can change its search strategy depending on what it just ate. So if we feed it a very concentrated food source, um, the next thing it'll do is it searches, its, it's overall morphology is much more of a mesh kind of around that food source. Um, the idea being that there's a greater, it thinks that there's a greater probability there's going to be another good quality food close by, so it kind of just searches that local area. If you give it something that's kind of a eh, so-so quality, it will be much branchier. So rather than kind of growing and sort of doing this sort of localized search, it tends to become branchy and start searching much further away from the food source than if it was a high quality one. Um, and then just for fun, we've done things like um, looking at economically irrational behavior, like if you put a decoy item in the food set, um, the, the slime will sort of like, it'll change the way the slime will value the other two, which is something that happens in humans, but you don't normally you just expect to see in someone's own brain. Uh, and it does have speed accuracy trade-offs. So if you give it a choice between two things, but then you don't give it very much time to make that decision, it will tend to make more mistakes. These are very human sort of psychology kind of things that we see in the slime mold. So although these things are just blobs, I'd argue that they are still very interesting because they can do all of this behavior, and we have only the vaguest idea why. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that all of these different behaviors are quite different from one another. So it's not like it can just do this one thing. Uh, it seems to have systems for doing all sorts of different behaviors. Um, and I, I wish I thought of this, but this is before I started with slime molds. Um, the, the paper that started it all, this was in 2000, uh, this is a colleague of mine, Toshiyuki Nakagaki from Japan. Um, he was working on slime molds, and I can only presume that after having you know, way too much sake one night, he was like, I'm going to put this thing in a maze and see what happens. <laughs> Any of the other slime mold research, as far as we knew, this was just a blob. And so he put it into a maze, and those white piles you can see are just piles of oats. You know, the slime mold likes oats. Weird. And so at first the slime mold just fills the whole maze. Nothing really exciting. You can see sort of waves of movement happening in there. Um, no, that's interesting. But over time, what will happen is the slime mold will start to retract away from dead ends. So you can see in a second here. You see how some of those veins are starting to turn white? So that's the slime mold pulling away, leaving just its goo behind. Um, it tends to be more likely to retract from dead ends, so that's not going anywhere, I'm not going to use that. It also doesn't particularly like loops or any kind of redundancies in its network, so it's like, ah, I'm not going to get rid of that. And then at the end of 24 hours, the slime mold has basically found the shortest way to connect those two food sources through the maze. So, yeah. And again, this is, this is really just a blob of goo. It's, it's just not, it's not, it doesn't have a brain, but it's able to do this as well. And then, you know, you think that was the weirdest thing that Toshi could think of, but another night of sake. You know, and he decided he's going to put oats on the locations of all the major subway stations on the Tokyo Metro. Because what else? Of course, that's what you're going to do. Since we're back in the morning. Um, and he put the slime mold on it, the slime mold retracts. And when you compare the network of slime mold makes to the uh, Tokyo underground, it's almost identical. So whatever rules the Japanese um, <laughs> were using <laughs> to build their network is essentially identical to what the slime mold does. Since that paper, done thing amongst the slime mold people that you know replicate the networks of our home cities and see you know how close is the slime mold to to our Sydney's is not so far is pretty far away from the slime mold one so take that as you will <laughs> either we're smarter than the slime mold or uh, yeah, 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 yeah. so uh, yes yeah, so these things can do fairly amazing amazing things given that they have no brain okay so I'll change gears a little bit now so that's mostly I want to talk about um, transportation networks, but I did want to mention supply chains, at least briefly, because um, this is sort of a new ARC project that I've just started along with uh, collaborators from logistics and transportation science uh, at USUD, and a collaborator who does sort of swarm intelligence biology stuff in New Jersey. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is find ways not only of modeling natural supply chains, but then also trying to look for similarities between human supply chains, given that it's possible there. Uh, so just very briefly, in terms of what an ant colony, for example, needs to do, and we might think of an ant colony as just going out and bringing back food, but there's a lot of different sub-things that need to happen. Um, ants, at a very minimum, need four different things. Building materials, for one, so this is a meat ant colony down here. Each of those little things um, is a particle that the ants have collected, and they use them as sort of ornaments on the colony. I still don't know what the purpose of these things are, but they are super OCD about where they're placed. Like, if you move one, it'll replace it exactly where it was, 
Um, and they're very particular. That's not a random assortment of things in the environment. They seem to be very careful about sourcing these things in particular places and putting them in particular places, and we don't really know why. Um, but they are very, very particular about that. They need to find water. Um, they need carbohydrates. And as I mentioned, they farm other insects for those carbohydrates. Um, all the pictures are examples of different things with different animal farming. So it's not like they only have this relationship with one species of aphid. Um, they have scale insects and a, a whole bunch of <coughs> other things that these insects farm. And presumably all of these vary in the quality of the secretions they produce, the amount of secretions they produce, how far away they are from the colony. Um, uh, and how much work they are to defend, because the ant's contribution to the aphid is to defend them from predators. Like if a ladybird, which are voracious predators, um, came by, you know, they would fight it off. So there are decisions to be made in terms of which of these colonies of the set of, um, I'm sorry, which uh, of these aphid farms in the set of potential aphid farms the ant actually ends up monopolizing. Uh, there's protein. So for example, at the bottom there, some ants will be predatory. They'll take out other insects or other arthropods for food. Others will collect seeds. And many others are just opportunistic, so they'll eat whatever falls on the ground. And again, same kinds of decisions need to be made. Which of these things should they bring back? Which ones are worth the effort? Which ones are not? Um, yes. Once things are brought back to the colony, there are all sorts of questions about transportation, which I kind of already talked about in terms of optimizing the network. Um, but what I didn't mention is that there's also questions about how you optimize the flow on the network itself. So how do you keep traffic optimized? Uh, and there has been some research, um, mostly um, by Audrey Dutour in Toulouse, but by a few others, looking at how ants actually manage traffic, you know, at least in a very, very, very basic kind of network. And then once you're in the nest, there's things like recruiting your friends, telling them where to go, where do you store things. So again, the example being those crazy honeypot ants who have internal storage, but some ants will actually build storage areas. Um, some will process the food into, um, into what we call insect jerky, which is a sort of dried insect that they can store. Uh, and there's all sorts of things to do with waste disposal uh, and corpse removal. What I wanted to point out is that there's also a fair amount of food processing that goes in on in the colony. So not only um, will they dry some foods out to preserve them, um, but because of this weird quirk of evolution and ant anatomy, an adult ant can't actually eat solid food. Those tiny little narrow ant wastes mean that nothing solid can actually go through them. So when you see an ant carrying like an insect or something, it's not actually going to eat that directly because it can't. Anything solid will not pass through its tiny little waste. So what they do is they feed that food to their larva. Now the larva, uh, or the baby ant, just looks kind of like maggots. I mean, they're just sort of big brown tubes. Um, they don't have that waste problem. So they can eat solids. They'll then convert that into something the adult ant can have and they'll regurgitate it to the adult. So that's what's happening in that picture. The little baby ant is about to regurgitate in the adult's ant um, to feed it. Hilariously, in some of the more primitive species, um, this has yet to evolve. So these guys here are kind of creepy looking because they are super creepy. They're called Dracula ants or vampire ants. Um, and the way they feed, they've kind of, they haven't yet evolved the whole regurgitating part. They just suck the blood out of their offspring straight up. Um, the little larvae will have heaps of little scars on their body. Doesn't seem to bother them. They still mature into to functional adults. Yeah, I haven't quite figured out the why don't you just regurgitate it part. <laughs> so un unlike human children, the uh, ant larvae are sort of this important part of the society and they contribute towards um, processing and keeping the food flows um, going. Uh, I won't dwell on honeybees except to point out that they have very many of the same constraints. The big difference with honeybees though, which I haven't actually talked about very much up until now, uh, is that they have one colony, they don't have a transportation infrastructure in terms of uh, trails, they just fly in a beeline from the food or from the nest. What's interesting for them though is that they, there are questions about how they optimize the load because it costs them energy to fly. Flying is very energetic um, and it has to be worth it to go to a food source. So one of the things that has been found is that if a bee is going out to forage on pollen, so pollen is not something the adult bees make themselves, that's just for the larva, they need to pack a lunch. So they have to fill up on a certain amount of honey, which gives them the energy they need to fly to that pollen source. And it turns out that they are very, very careful about optimizing the amount um, of honey that they take. So if it's something that's far away, they take a little bit more, just enough to get them there and back. If it's a close food source, they'll take a lot less. Um, and they can also get this information from following the dance. So if they follow a very long dance, which is indicating a far away food source, they take more honey on board before they take off um, than if they follow a short dance. And we've just started to do some experiments to look at whether or not they can vary that load depending on the variability <coughs> in how you do it. So it's sort of high quality sometimes and low quality others, so risky. 
Uh, and I think if they know a resource is risky, then they'll take a little bit more, a little bit extra than they would if it's sort of a more stable resource. So there's lots of questions there in terms of how you optimize the amount you take on. Okay. So I hope I've convinced you that these systems are interesting, <laughs> you know, that they can do clever things. And although you think of ants and slime molds as being kind of stupid, that isn't really true. They've got all these collective behaviors that are really interesting. Um, and the one point that I want to make is that complex systems, these complex biological systems are highly resilient. So this is a fire ant nest that has been flooded. When that happens, the fire ants all link bodies together to form this sort of living raft slash road thing. And that allows them to float away to safety. Um, and they can form these very, very quickly. Uh, and, and yeah, this basically saves them when they do it. Uh, hilariously, they put their babies on the bottom <laughs> because they're fatter and more buoyant. So it kind of holds the raft up. So yeah, they're kind of alien in some ways too. Um, so this is a good example of sort of resilience uh, of one of these systems. Uh, but of course we can think of all sorts of different perturbations that can happen to a colony. And these can include sort of and we can look at these in terms of how likely they are to happen and how severe they are. So in the category of very likely but not so severe, you, know, you can lose a few workers because say I stepped on them or something happened. Or, that's just sort of what happens to ant colonies. They lose workers. It's not particularly severe, but it's something that happens constantly. There can be changes in traffic conditions. There can be changes in supply. Uh, and there can be changes in demand. And we kind of looked experimentally in the field at, at these sort of minor changes in a really simple way. Um, we had an ant colony. We stuck two sticks to beside it. Um, one area led to this really concentrated fooder, feeder and one to a low quality. Um, and the idea is that if the colony is doing something clever, which they can all do, they'll put more resources. They'll put more uh, workers on the high one than the low one. That's pretty straightforward. But what we do after that, after half an hour, we swap the qualities. So now the one that used to be high is crummy. The one that was crummy is good. And so the question, the challenge for the colony is to redistribute its workforce so that now it puts more on the high quality than the low. Um, and when you look at it, they vary wildly in their ability to do this. So these are five different species of ants, so five completely different types of ants with different ecologies. I'll walk you through this in a second. Um, what you're looking at is proportion of foragers on the high quality food source. So irrespective of where it is, how many, what proportion of the total number of ants are on that feeder, you expect that to be high because they're, just, they're being clever. That dotted line tells you where I switched them. So at that point, there's a switch, and now the, call, the high quality is in a different place. And just for two examples, this is a species that has no problem with this. So you can see they dip down um, a little bit right after the change, but they quickly are able to go actually a little bit higher um, allocation than before. So they're, they're very good at this kind of problem. It, it barely even phases them that there's been a switch. They very quickly reallocate their effort. On the other hand, you have species like this, uh, which are rubbish at this kind of a problem. I mean, they're very good at having a high proportion of their foraging force on the high quality feeder initially, but when you swap it, they crash out and they're all still on the same spatial location, even though it's not good anymore. So species seem to vary in their ability to do these <coughs> kind to deal with change, and that's, that's kind of a key thing I'll come back to. Uh, in terms of things that can happen that are more severe but less common, you have the loss of lots of workers. So for example, bee colonies, um, if you are a farmer and you're spraying pesticides, you're not meant to spray them at times when bees are foraging, because obviously the insecticides will kill bees too. Every now and then there's a mistake and someone sprays when they're not meant to, it, and then you have mass die-off of basically the entire foraging force of a colony. Uh, and that, that is an extremely serious situation because there's no one getting food in the colony. The colony now has to adapt, has to speed up its developmental programs. All kinds of things have to happen for it to respond to that kind of a change. So it's severe but unlikely. Same thing. Um, if the nest is destroyed or if, say, a toxin is introduced into the network and has to be dealt with. So these are things that are really severe, but probably not so common. And so the question for this, this project that I've just started working on, well, technically I start working on it at the end of the month because the money hasn't showed up in my account until sort of two days from now, but then I'll be working on it. Um, the idea is to look at resilience in natural systems. So how do things like ant colonies, bee colonies, and slime molds deal with these kinds of perturbations? Uh, and what features of those systems make them resilient? Because as we saw before, some species seem quite good at dealing with things, others not so much. You know, what makes that difference? And then secondly, and, and this, after all of this biology, is essentially why I'm actually here, um, is can we translate that understanding of resilience in biological systems uh, into something that we can take managing infrastructures or something we can take inspiration from in terms of, of designing algorithms? So the idea of sort of bio-inspiration is by no means a new one. 
Uh, there's lots of examples of bio-inspired architecture. So that um, is a building in Ferrari that is patterned off of a termite mound. Termite mounds are able to self-regulate their temperature. Um, so by copying that mechanism, we now have self-regulating buildings that have super energy, super energy efficient. Um, this is a weird and pretty creepy quadrupedal robot called Big Dog. It's built off of uh, quadrupeds, so dogs and things walk. Um, and you can have things like algorithms, like genetic algorithms and, and ant colony optimization algorithms, which are, are based on living systems. Um, so again, depending on, like, and I'm a biologist, so I'm in the biology side of things. And often at the end of my papers, I have this sort of throwaway sentence, in this case, ants could therefore be an exciting source of new heuristics for solving problems faced by human supply chain networks and transportation systems. And, you know, um, and I may have had a referee once answer back, really. <laughs> you know, can you give me one example of when this has actually been used for any kind of actual optimization? To which my response is, of course, no. Um, no, it hasn't. So what, um, and whether or not you think that biological systems are appropriate for inspiration um, for solving these kinds of problems is kind of an open question, I think. I know some people come down hard on the, no way, we should never use these things. Uh, others are more open to it. I said, I'm a biologist, so I'm kind of neutral <laughs> on the issue. Uh, what I think, though, I do think there is some scope for us to be able to maybe look more into the systems, because I think um, the lack of collaboration between biologists uh, and people in more applied science and computer science and whatnot may be one of the reasons we don't have uh, as many good bio-inspired algorithms as we potentially could, or, or at least we haven't explored the possibilities as much as we could. Um, one of the reasons is because many systems are really poorly understood. So my understanding of what happens if you're, say, a computer scientist and you're interested in solving some sort of problem and, and you like bio and the whole bio-inspired thing, you might look through the literature, you might call up a biologist until you find a system that sort of is a good inspiration and then you kind of, you know, riff off of that, find it, abstract it, and come up with a, a reasonable algorithm. The problem is that we don't actually know that much about many of these systems, even though it might seem like we do from the literature. Um, the really good example of that is ant colony optimization. Um, which is based on the behavior of, call of trail laying ants. So ant finds a food source, lays a trail back to its nest. Other ants are more likely to follow that trail, um, and they're more likely to follow more concentrated trails. And that idea has been sort of abstracted into, um, into optimization algorithms. The thing is, the ants don't actually behave like that. <laughs> so one of the things, when I first started this postdoc, um, there were lots of models of this, and the models all show that that kind of a system is really, really prone to getting stuck on sort of suboptimal solutions. Because if now you throw in a new source that's better than this one, this trail keeps getting feedback. And so even if a few ants find this one, the strength of the new trail can't compete with this constantly reinforced trail to get poor food source. Now, of course, ants, I mean, if you've dropped a sandwich outside or left a brownie on your desk, you know that ants are flexible. They're able to find these new food sources and take advantage of them. And after doing some more experiments, it turns out they actually do have all these other mechanisms that aren't included in that original idea that allow them to have that kind of flexibility. Um, so I think if we look more into these behaviors and try to understand biologically how they work, that might provide a, a broader number of potential novel mechanisms that could be used to solve problems. Um, <coughs> the other thing I think we've generally failed to do is to take advantage of this tremendous diversity of biology. And again, ant colony optimization, I think, is a good example of this because it's called ant colony optimization, as if you know, there's one behavior of, of ants. And there isn't, because there are 30,000 different species of ant worldwide. There are 1,500 species of ant in Australia. Um, and that wouldn't matter if all of these things are behaving according to the same rules, but they're not. They vary tremendously in, say, how large their colonies are. They vary in their behavior. And when you take one example, they vary in how they recruit other individuals. So we know about trail laying ants, they lay pheromone trails, but even within the trail laying ants, there are some that lay long lasting pheromones, some that lay very volatile, short lasting pheromones, and some that lay multiple pheromones that have multiple meanings. So there's a whole different um, number of different ways of laying trail. There's also species that don't have any kind of recruitment. So one ant finds food, brings it back, no communication. There's other species where one ant finds food, brings the food back, does a dance that says, hey, there's food outside, and that's it. All the others go out, but they have no idea where that food is. It just tends to make them go out more than if there wasn't that. There's food dance. Um, there's some that have tandem running, which is what's happening in that, that particular. We have the two ants lined up. Tandem running is a fancy way of saying one ant teaches the other ant where to go. So she'll come back, she'll grab one or more ants, uh, and that ant will just follow her back to the food source. If this ant gets lost, she picks up a little puff of pheromone, whoop, helps her find it. 
and physically leads ants to the food source, so it's teaching them the way. Uh, and there's all sorts of different combinations of these where ants will use one system under some conditions and others under, under um, different situations. So to say that there's one behavior of ants is, is really misleading, and I think we're missing potential solutions because each of these different uh, combinations of colony size and recruitment mechanism and behavior have similar problems, but they may have come up, some of them may have come up with better ways of doing it um, than others, and we're kind of missing that by focusing on, on one or two ants. Uh, I know I haven't talked much about bees, but they're also part of this project. Um, and you might think there's one bee, you know, the yellow and black stripy bee. No, <laughs> no, there's lots. That's called a honeybee. And even in honeybees, there's seven different species of honeybee, all of which have different behavior. But there are only one type of social bee. There's honeybees, bumblebees, and stingless bees, all of which make colonies. Uh, and there's roughly 760 species of social bee worldwide, 11 species in Australia. And again, probably in all types of their way they communicate. Um, in their foraging qualities and how they store food, um, basically everything. Um, there's actually 60,000 species of bee if you include all the ones that, that don't form colonies, but which we don't really, I'm not so interested in because they're solitary, at least for this project anyway. I mean, even slime molds, I mean, you think seriously, how different can different blobs be? Um, <laughs> aside, from, you know, aside from differences in color, so these are just a few different species of varying color. Um, interestingly, and kind of as an aside, this one up here in the corner, is, is colloquially known as the dog's vomit slime mold. <laughs> it is its common name. Um, it was, uh, I had an honor student recently, and we decided to look at one of these other species. Um, it's a gray one that's not shown here, called Vimium um, iridis. And what we found is that its behavior is totally different from Fazan's. So rather than being repelled by its own goo, for example, it's perfectly happy to go where it's been. Uh, it also has this tendency to fragment into lots of little pieces that kind of go around, do stuff, and then come back together. So it's constantly fragmenting and reconnecting. Um, all aspects of its foraging behavior that we looked at were different than Fizarum's. So there's no reason to expect that even though they're all kind of <coughs> just blobs of goo, these blobs of goo have different rules and different ways of problem solving. So what I'm hoping to do, at least for this last part of the, um, the project, is to start with some kind of a question. And that's what I need help with, <laughs> is which questions are interesting, or at least have the potential to have an application down the track. It can be as simple as, you know, how does an ant colony or part of its network is damaged. How does it reroute you know, other individuals? Uh, it can be what happens when individuals are removed. Um, from that, that question, you know, the next step for me is to do comparative experiments. And that's where I think it's going to be different. Because rather than focusing on one species and being like, this is how ants behave, you take the same question and you ask it from diff to different um, creatures. So you ask ants, you ask slime molds, you can, you ask bees. Uh, and hopefully when you do that, you end up with this sort of diversity of responses. So this is just a made up graph, really. <laughs> One is, say, let's say I'm interested in looking at the loss of individuals. How do the loss of individuals affect colony level function? And <coughs> let's say we define colony function, in this case, as how much they're able to harvest. Um, you could have ants res or in all sorts of different ways. Some, like trailing ants, will probably do very, very well until they reach some threshold number of individuals and it quickly falls apart. Others might be able to function, but you know they slowly decline. Um, there's also sorts of different responses, and we might say that of all of these, this is the one that has the behavior that's most desirable from, a, from an applied perspective. And then I can go back in and we can say, oh, okay, what makes this system good? What underlying behavior, you know, what one system uh, have what we think is desirable behavior versus you know, the be behavior that we don't like? Uh, that allows us to get this more comprehensive understanding of what makes a system resilient, what makes it functional. Uh, and from that, I think it creates a better point to start jumping off and looking at which of these things we might want to think of in terms of creating algorithms or, or, or using for bio-inspiration. So I kind of think of it as you end up with this toolbox of biological systems, you know. Trailing ants will be really good for solving network optimization problems, but really rubbish at some other kind of problem. You know, bees might be rubbish at everything, <laughs> you know, depending on, on what we're looking for. But we'll have a much better understanding, I hope, on how these things actually work and what properties make one system more useful for, say, um, abstraction, and which ones are probably not going to be particularly helpful. And worst case scenario, we end up learning a lot about biology, which, of course, for me is, <laughs> is perfectly sufficient. So I, I hope this approach is kind of something that will yield, probably in both domains, but you know, if it's just biology, that's, that's good by me, too. So uh, just a quick acknowledgement slide. Uh, I have a lot of collaborators in a lot of different disciplines, because I'm a biologist, so I need help with, say, the mathematics, I need help with the computer science. Uh, and I am here because I am looking for more collaborators, so if anything I've said is of interest to you, please let me know. Um, 
be great to get in touch and I'm always interested in talking to new people. And lastly, if anybody's looking for a job, um, uh, the project I talked just about is supply chain management. We are advertising for a senior research analyst. I think it's a two year full time position, pays reasonably well, it's based in Sydney. Um, and the main role we develop are these mathematical models of supply chains, both human supply chains and also some of the, the uh, animal ones. I know it says up there, open to current University of Sydney employees, but that's a mistake. It's not actually supposed to say that, so it's open to anyone. So if you or someone who you know is looking for a job, please let me know or keep the chat. I'm looking for people. <coughs> so if anyone has questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thanks for listening. I kind of prattled on there a little. <laughs> Where we have, you can imagine sort of two arms, and they have different combinations of good and you know, low quality food sources. And this one overall is crappier. This one overall is better, but the farmer doesn't know that, and so it samples a certain way. So we kind of set that up, and the idea being that we want to know what precision rule the farmer will know is going to say, okay, it's time to stop exploring this arm if I have enough information to tell you. Um, not. And then we've tried to look not not so much as computer algorithms, but we've kind of had a set of potential precision rules. Bayesian decision rules and things. We tried to work out if, um, which one the farm was using, and I don't know yet because we haven't finished the analysis. But I mean, if it comes to that, that would be very cool to look at it and figure it out. Uh, anybody got questions? No, I think we got, we're good here on questions. It was a very cool talk. Thank you, Tanya. Um, Any one questions? I think the mic is on. No, the mic is on. Um, one question, maybe. You were talking about uh, switching in um, decision and foraging. Uh, you said that at the moment there's not much knowledge about what the mechanism might be behind of that. Um, do you know any possible candidates for it? Yeah, so it's, it's not that we, we had some ideas of how it might work. Um, what we think is happening is that they tend to increase the frequency that they U-turn if they come into contact with something they like. So it's like another mechanism of being able to really, really quickly reinforce what would have otherwise been a really weak trail. So we have sort of a really strong trail and sort of a weaker competing trail that normally wouldn't, wouldn't work. They'd all end up collapsing on this one. Because the ants are kind of doing these sort of turns really rapidly, it essentially means they're putting out more pheromones faster on the lower branch. And that, I think, is what's allowing at least some of the systems to change. But on the other hand, some of the, I didn't, I ain't going into too much detail on this, but in that field experiment, not all of those ants were trailing, so some of them were using um, different mechanisms, and I'm not entirely sure how they work. Although, I mean, it can be something as simple as individual memory, right? You can have some individuals that just, um, if they take something they don't like, they just don't go back, and they go and look for something else. And that, at a very basic level, would be a method to start to shift the decision um, one way or another. We know that bees can do that. We've done experiments where we've it's a bit of a long story, but we've done experiments that disable the ability of bees to waggle. Uh, and they're still able, even without that communication mechanism, they can still swap back and forth. And we think it's because the bees themselves have a memory and can, can use that to make decisions, even if they don't have their communication system. Um, so I guess the, there's probably a lot of different ways of doing it. And it probably varies depending on the species. 
Thank you. All right.